exactly what he did. He came down to us by the grace of God. That great gulf, that great span between us and God um, caused by our sin. Jesus spanned that, that gulf. The scripture makes it very plain. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Uh, literally, if you look at the picture of it, Jesus Christ made a bridge from heaven to earth through his own body going to the cross so that we might be with the Father one day. And I praise God for this morning for his faithfulness. If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter number 12. Exodus chapter number 12. We're going to read a few verses in Exodus chapter 12. Uh, we're finishing up. I, I think we're finishing up. We're going along, I'll put it that way, in our story as far as um, the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt. And want to encourage you concerning that passage of Scripture as well. Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> I'd like to start reading verse number 21 this morning. Exodus chapter 12, verse number 21. Amen. While you're going there, I'd like to bring you a couple of other scriptures, which will be um, the introduction to our sermon this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, Paul is speaking, and he speaks to you and I and those of us who are willing to read the word of the Lord and believe it, and by the grace of God, want to recognize something. Uh, we're in the Old Testament this morning in the book of Exodus, although we'll be reading this scripture out of the New Testament. Um, but um, Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, Peter, James, and John, everybody in the New Testament, Paul, um, spoke to us and taught us from the Old Testament. They called it the Law and Prophets, but it was the Old Testament. There was no such thing as the New Testament. And so when Paul is speaking in this passage of Scripture, he's talking about things that had happened in the passage of Scripture we're going to read this morning in the book of Exodus. And he says that you and I, New Testament Christians, need to learn from them. And I would challenge you to realize that when we read the Bible, uh, we find out very quickly that these things were written for our examples. Let me read these Scriptures to you, and you'll hear it from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, starting with verse number uh, uh, 5 this morning. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of the serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of you also of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. That passage of scripture brings us twice in that uh, area, that those things that are written in the Old Testament, things we'll be reading about this morning, are written for our examples, and he says in a warning towards the end there, lest you fall, take heed, pay attention to them, so that you don't fall and do the same things that they did that caused them problems. Um, when we read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, we read about things um, that happened to King David and the great mistake he made and all the, the downfall that happened to him because of that. We read about um, Solomon and the things that happened to Solomon because of his downfall, and we say, those things are stupid. I don't want to do those because I read them and realize God was uh, had to lift his hand of blessing off of them because they did them. We read about scriptures where Samuel knew what God wanted him to do. Hezekiah, Josiah, when he hears the word of the Lord, uh, knows what God wants him to do, and they became uh, leaders of the children of Israel and doing the right things because they repented of the, the wrong things were being done. They said, we want to follow God and have him, as the song says this morning, we want him to lead us and help and be pleased with us. And so we read the Old Testament in order to know uh, what they were doing that caused them problems so that we don't have the same problems. Um, I, I think you and I know, and uh, maybe as we get older, it's a lot easier to see. Um, when we're young, we're pretty much invulnerable. We know everything about everything. I saw a um, note one day on a restaurant, uh, and I can't remember which restaurant, but I saw a, a picture on the wall someone had written, and it said, um, hire a teenager before they get old and don't know anything anymore. If you're a teenager this morning, I apologize. 
highly. But I would tell you this morning that by the grace of God, he has made it very plain to us that as we grow and mature, we learn more and more about things because of experience. And especially, and I would tell you this morning, that experience, the, 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 the phrase is, experience is the best teacher. But it's not always the easiest teacher. When you do something wrong and you go through the sorrow of it, you've learned something and there's an experience that is, is there. God wants you to keep from having that sorrow. And in every situation where we do the wrong thing, we, it's a good lesson. We learn something real good. But I would challenge you, it's not the easiest way. The easiest way is the same kind of thing when your mom says, don't touch that stove, that's hot. You don't have to experience it and say, wow, she was right. Just believe her, keep your hands off the stove. Um, <clears throat> don't drive 100 because you'll get yourself in trouble. It's easier to hear that than it is to, to follow that example and go ahead and do it and find out I, I should have listened to that. And so the word of God tells us this in, the, in more than one scripture that the children of Israel were in situations where they had been taught of the Lord, they had seen what God did, and they still did foolish things. And you and I don't want to do those foolish things. And so as the scripture says this morning, we want to remind ourselves that when we read the Old Testament, it's a picture of what to do, what not to do. And the easiest way is to do what God tells us to do because because he has our best interest in mind. I hope you know, hope people are watching this later on will recognize, no one loves you more than God. Not your husband, not your wife, not your boyfriend, not your girlfriend, uh, not your mother, not your father. No one loves you more than Jesus. He proved that by going to the cross and taking your sin debt. He said, I love you enough, I'll let them do those things to me that you see done to me because I love you. And so when we realize that, we realize that he has always loved us. The scripture makes it very plain that he is the same yesterday and today and forever. And if we know he went to the cross yesterday and died for us, we know he loved us before that and he loves us after that because he doesn't change. A uh, passage of scripture tells us, I am the Lord, I change not. I am immutable. I, I love you, and I can't help but love you. At the same time, we can serve a just God where when we step out of his love and we get ourselves in a situation where we shouldn't be, we end up suffering. It's kind of like if you go down a pathway and somebody tells you, um, you go down this way here and you turn right to that. Uh, don't turn left because left is uh, an area where there's quicksand down there, so don't turn left. And you decide, well, I know left is shorter, so I'm going to go left anyhow. And when you go left anyhow, you'll find out they were right, the quicksand is there, and now it's too late to do much about it. The quicksand literally grabs us up. That's the wrongdoing we have in our life when we start falling into those things, and that's why the Lord tells us, go the right path, go the way I tell you to go, and it's in the Old Testament. I want to learn that this morning. Bow your heads with me, if you will. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. I ask in Jesus' name that you will teach us from this passage of Scripture the things that would help us to be pleasing to you and to be blessed in our life. We want, Lord, to have everything in our life go well, and it's our desire, Lord, that we be pleasing to you because that's what you want as well, that you would help us to be blessed day by day, hour by hour, as we walk in your will, as we walk according to your word. I pray in Jesus' name that you'll bless and be with those who are here this morning. For those, Lord, um, who are watching this later on, encourage them as well, that you love them and you want the very best for them. Encourage them in Jesus' name as we desire to as well. And we ask you these things in Jesus' name as we pray one more time. Honor us, Lord, with your presence this morning as we honor you with our hearing, our receiving, our obedience to the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Going back to the Old Testament and the scripture, and with one we just now reminded you of, that these things are written for our examples. I want to read a scripture for you in the book of Exodus, chapter number uh, 14. Um, we will go to chapter 12. But Exodus chapter 14, verse number uh, 31, uh, 30 and 31. The Bible says, The Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. The people Israel saw that great work that God did and believed on him. Now that scripture is very plain. That's the 14th chapter of Exodus. And I want to encourage you that they saw those things like you and I see things by the Spirit. I did not have to go to the cross to Golgotha to see Jesus dying on the cross. I know he did that by faith in my soul. I know he did that. I know that he was raised from the dead, not because I've been to the empty tomb, but I know that by faith that he did that. And I have the assurance of the Lord Jesus Christ in my heart. I have the assurance that he said, by his stripes you are healed. 
because he has healed me. I have the assurance to know that he has taken my sins away because my sins have been lifted up. I don't have to see more proof than that. It's my belief, as this passage of Scripture says, when we see those things, we should then believe on what God said and follow his word. Now, some of them did, some of them didn't. And I would challenge you this morning, if you want to walk with the Lord and find great pleasure in him, it's our determination, let's do what he tells us to do. I want to remind you of what we said so far, bringing this passage of Scripture. The children of Israel were in bondage in, in Egypt for many years, according to the promise of God. Uh, when God told Abraham, your, your people will wander, they will be vagabonds, they will sojourn, uh, they will look for a place to stay. Many people will abuse them, and they will be in, in the land uh, of their captivity for many years, and I will bring them out. Well, the Scripture says when uh, the people began to cry out to the Lord after Egyptian bondage, that God answered that prayer and said, I'm going to send you a deliverer. His name was Moses. I'm not going to preach the sermon I've already preached in the last three or four weeks concerning the plagues, but I would challenge you to go back and look at those. If not, at least to re read the book of Exodus, uh, the first few chapters, and see the plagues that God sent to the Egyptians so that the Israelites could be released. This passage of Scripture is involved with that, where God said, this is what I'm going to do in order to deliver you, and Israel saw those things. <clears throat> I'd like to give you an example here. Israel saw, at least many of them saw, the Red, or the Nile River turn to blood. They saw that. Israel saw, didn't have to experience it because they were in their homes and not in Egyptian homes, but they experienced by, by vision the frogs coming out and the fish dying. They observed the lice that were in the land. They observed the flies and the bees that came and, and, and um, tormented the Egyptians. Uh, they in, uh, uh, endured, if you want to use that term, with the sorrow of the Egyptians around them when their animals died or when they got boils on their body. They endured those things. When the hail fell, the children of Israel saw those things happen and it caused them, at least it should have, to believe that. When the locusts passed over their land and came into Egyptian, uh, Egyptian uh, territory and began eating all the crops, the children of Israel saw that and they should have believed. When, they got, when darkness came for three days and they heard about the three days of darkness, that when all the houses of the Egyptians, they recognized we have light by the grace of God. And they believed that because they saw that. When God told Moses, tell your children, tell your followers to put blood on the doorpost, the top post, the two Door, to two side posts because the Passover angel is going to come and if he sees the blood on the upper post the two side posts that death angel will pass over your house and your firstborn will not die if the blood is not on the doorpost your firstborn in that house is going to die. They saw the blessing of God when they put the blood on the doorpost and the death angel passed by. They heard the wailing of the Egyptians when their firstborn died because they didn't have blood on the doorpost. They experienced that. They knew that. So I would challenge you this morning. They had every reason to believe that what God said God was going to do. Let me read in uh, Exodus chapter 12 this morning, starting verse number 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to the families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through the smite through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lentil and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this this thing for a ordinance to thee and thy sons forever. I already mentioned this last week, but I'm going to bring it again this morning. They were supposed to do this every single year on the first month on the 10th to the 14th day, they were supposed to be reminded every single year all along the lines. The scripture makes it very plain, and I read them to you last week, and I hope you go look those up. Uh, if not, look at the days of Josiah later on in Second Chronicles, I believe, chapter number 35, and you'll find out that while Samuel was one of the prophets that led the children of Israel, and while Joshua was there, they did observe this year after year. But from the days of Samuel through all the kings of Israel, all the way up to Josiah, they didn't do it perfectly for 500 years. Actually, 522. For 522 years, they forgot to remind their children, this is what happened. God brought us out of Egypt, and the firstborn of the Egyptians were dying, and did die because they didn't have the blood on the doorpost, and that's why we do this every year. That's why we remind ourselves of this every year, and they pass that on to their children. Let me bring a thought to you very quickly this morning. Some of the problems we're having in the United States today, quite frankly, is because of bad parenting. 
that might be me too. I'm not just saying all parents are bad. But I'm saying, telling you this, that the scripture makes it very plain that as parents, when we receive the Lord into our heart, we're supposed to pass that knowledge on to our children and give them the understanding. We are blessed in our family because of this and this and this, by this and this and this, because God has blessed us. He promised us, if you'll do this, I will do that. Here's the example of that. And when we don't pass that on to our children, we fulfill the scripture that's later on found in the book of Judges, where there's a whole generation who doesn't know who God is. And because they don't know who God is, they start meandering around trying to find the right way, and they get themselves in trouble after trouble after trouble. And quite frankly, this is my opinion. You can throw it out the window if you want to. But the things that are being taught in college today are not biblical. They're not according to the word of the Lord. They are very far from what God wants them to know. And we are turning out atheist after atheist after atheist because we haven't told them in the church and from parents who God is and what God wants for their lives. Challenging you this morning that we should do that. The scripture says in verse 25, and it shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised that you shall keep this servant service and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you what mean ye by this service that ye shall say it is a sacrifice of the lord's passover who passed over the houses of the children of israel in egypt when he smote the egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshiped i would challenge you this morning with that thought that they didn't just bow their head and say praise god that he's on our side but they began following him being obedient to him and i would challenge you that if you want to worship god the first thing you need to do is be obedient because obedience is more of worship to God than it is raising your hands and praising God. I'm not trying to take anything away from raising your hands and, and thanking and praising God. But if on Sunday morning or on Wednesday night, Friday night, whatever time it is, we learn to, to stand and hold our hands up and praise God and the rest of the week we forget who he is, that's not worship. Jesus made it very plain in the sixth chapter of Matthew when he said this, you shall worship the, the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve. You see, Jesus connected in the same verse by the word and you shall worship the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve. He connected worship and service in the same verse by saying the best, play, the best way to worship is by serving. And if you don't serve, you're not worshiping. In this passage of scripture, the Bible says that they bowed their heads in worship. The children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. Verse number 29, and it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, rise up. Up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and your children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. I would uh, direct your attention to the idea that not only we read the scripture to let you know that God said, this is what I'm going to do, and then he did it. We're living in a time when people hear what God said, but they don't believe he's going to do it. And I would challenge you that one of the best examples we have that is in the New Testament where the Bible says that they, in the day and time we're living, say, all things continue as they were, nothing's changed. Where is the promise of his coming? You keep telling me he's coming back. Where is the promise of his coming? All things have changed. And they are willingly ignorant of the fact that what God said, there's gonna be a flood, there was a flood, this passage of scripture, there's going to be an angel that kills your firstborn if you don't put the blood on the doorpost, and that's exactly what happened. And every time God said, this is what I'm going to do, as this passage of scripture says, that's what he did. Now, there are people out there who don't believe that. I hope there are not people in here that don't believe that, because when we don't believe that, it's not to God's hurt, it's to our hurt. I don't know how many times I've said this, but I'm getting ready to say it one more time this morning. If you decide to obey God, he is not going to be bigger or smaller than he was before you made your decision. If you decide to disobey God, he is not going to be bigger or smaller than he was before you walked in disobedient. But the fact of the matter is, when you obey God, your life changes, and when you disobey God, your life changes. So when we recognize it's not making God bigger if I obey him, it's making my life better, how foolish is it to decide I'm not going to be obedient to the Lord? In this passage of scripture, the Bible says that's what God said he's going to do, and the scripture says he did that. This was one of the things that firsthand, if there were Egyptian, or there were Israelites who were not close to enough to Egyptian houses, that they didn't see the hail fall or the fire go 
ago, if there were people in, in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel lived, which is up towards the right-hand corner of Egypt, if there were people who didn't live close enough to the Red Sea uh, and to the um, Nile River that they didn't see the Nile River turn into blood, there may have been people that did not. If they may not have seen those things, they may not have seen uh, the boils that were on people that were Egyptians. They may not have seen that. But they saw this. They saw, they heard the death angel pass over the house because I put blood on the doorpost and they didn't and they lost their firstborn and I didn't. So up until now, there may have been an excuse that they may not have seen. This scripture is an example. They knew because they saw it. And then I would challenge you to realize what they did with the knowledge. It's an amazing thing sometimes to me that we can know and still do something really stupid. In the 14th chapter of Exodus, and you would look this later on, you're going to find that scripture says in the chapter 14 that God says, I'm going to bring you by a way in order to bring you out of Egypt. Um, I'm going to bring you to a way to, that's going to end up putting you at the Red Sea. That's the scripture. And when they got to the um, 14th chapter and they followed the word of the Lord, they followed Moses. They got to a place where there's a mountain on this side. You can actually look this up on the internet. You, I saw some the other day who had actually taken pictures of the actual area where there was a mountain on this side, a mountain on that side, a valley that they passed through just before they came to the Red Sea. When they got to the Red Sea, they didn't know what they were gonna do. I bring a thought to you this morning and maybe ask you the question. You don't have to raise your hand if you want to, but have you been, ever been in a situation where you, where you didn't know what to do? I have. A lot of times I didn't know what to do. It would seem like at one moment, this is the best decision for me to make, and then something would enter my head, and I, I don't want to do that, and I don't want to do that. And I would think maybe this is the best thing I need to do, and someone else, I'd talk it over with my wife or my kids or something like that, and they would mention something, and then as they mentioned, I realized, no, I don't want to do that. That's a wrong decision. Let me bring a thought to you. God always knows the right decision. And so when you're in a situation where you don't know what to do, ask him. Ask him. The Bible makes it very plain. Book of, uh, book of um, uh, Luke chapter number seven. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Just ask. Another passage of the scripture, the book of James says, you have not because you ask not. You live your life with the idea, I'll just take my chances. I'll put, just put my foot out there and go the way I think is the right way. And when you fall down, you wonder why in the world did God let me fall down? Because you went without asking. And in this passage of scripture, they didn't know what to do. And rather than asking God what to do and asking Moses what was going to happen, when they got to the Red Sea, they had a mountain on this side, they had a mountain on this side, they were in the valley, they were at the Red Sea, and behind them came the Egyptian army. After Pharaoh had changed his mind from letting them go with chariots of iron, deciding to run over the children of Israel. And the children of Israel began crying out, I'll use that term because that's exactly what happened, crying out to Moses, asking him what he was going to do. And he says in verse number 11, uh, 10 and 11, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. If you don't know, they never said that. If you don't know, you can read the scripture. They never said that. What they're saying now is, we don't know what's going to happen. The Egyptians are right behind us. Didn't we tell you just leave us in Egypt? No, they didn't. What they said was, get us out of here because our firstborn is, is being killed by uh, Pharaoh and we're being beaten every day. Get us out of here. And the scripture makes it very plain that they said now, uh, didn't we tell you just to let us alone? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians which ye have seen, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace now I have to bring it because I've, I think I beat this horse a lot they saw the plagues or heard about the plagues they saw the Passover lamb with their own eyes they experienced the idea that the Passover angel passed over their house and their firstborn didn't know they had every reason from what they had heard that God did in the other ten plagues to the Egyptians every reason to know what God said God meant and God did. 
So in this passage of scripture, when they get to the Red Sea and they don't know what to do and they start crying out to the Lord, Moses says, don't be afraid. God is going to fight for you. I would even say if I wanted to make it more pointed, the same God that got you out of Egypt with all those plagues and all that other stuff, he's going to fight for you. You're not going to see these Egyptians ever more after this day. Today's going to be the last time you see them. Now, I hope by the grace of God that when you get to a place in your life where you don't know what to do and someone gives you the answer that God's going to fight for you, that you don't start doubting God and saying, I don't think God can help me. Because I was challenging you this morning, and this is maybe the easiest way to learn this and be able to follow this. If God can't help you in a situation, there is no help. So you better pray and ask God to help you because the scripture makes it very plain. Paul in the book of Romans, the eighth chapter, if God is for us, nobody can be against us. Who can be against us? The devil, which means nobody can be against us. And so in this passage of scripture, they heard the word of the Lord and they heard Moses say, I'm going to make a way for you and you're not going to see these these Egyptians anymore. If you know the scripture, you're going to find out, find out as you read the rest of the 14th chapter. I already ran out of time, so I can't read anymore. But the scripture says they got to the Red Sea. Moses held the rod up, and God parted the Red Sea. Now, lest you doubt that, I would challenge you to read further in the Bible, and you're going to find out that the Philistines, who were not of the children of Israel, heard that story and reminded themselves of what God did at the Red Sea. That Rahab and her people in Jericho heard that story and believed what God did when he opened the Red Sea for them. The Israelites may not have believed it, but the pagans believed it because they heard what had happened and they believed what God did. The scripture says they get to the Red Sea, Moses holds his rod out, the waters are parted, they go across on dry land, and when the Egyptians decided to ride their chariots into the Red Sea to cover over them, the Bible says that they were drowned in the Red Sea. Let me bring one other thought because you might not know this. The children of Israel were led by the grace of God by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. The scripture says that when the Egyptians came down with their chariots and they were coming down to get where the children of Israel were, that God put a pillar of fire there and the Egyptians had to hold their chariots up. We can't go any further because this pillar, pillar of fire is here. To me, that would be a pretty good example that God's going to take care of you when you get to the Red Sea. At least that is to me. The scripture makes it very plain. They get to the Red Sea. Moses holds the rod up. The, the sea is parted. They went through on dry ground. And when the Egyptians decided to follow them and they went into the water, the scripture says that the water covered over them and they drowned just like God said he was going to do to them. And the ones that had been, chariot, had been hurting them in chariots all that time were drowned and they saw their dead bodies floating on the shore. That's what the scripture says. They saw their chariots being overwhelmed by the Red Sea. That's what the scripture says. Now, if they haven't had enough reason up until this time to believe, I don't know what else you can give them. But the fact of the matter is, they still didn't believe. Because in the 15th chapter, they had this marvelous blessing of God, praising God for getting rid of the Egyptians, bringing us out of Egypt. We're free people now. We're not slaves anymore. And look at the marvelous thing God did for us in the 15th chapter of Exodus. The whole chapter is uh, um, singing songs and playing tamb tambourines and praising God for the victory. And then they get to chapter 16. Just a few days past that. Chapter 16. And they come to a place where there's no water. Now, instead of saying, God got us out of Egypt, God put the plagues on them, God got us out of the death of the firstborn, God blessed us who got us through the Red Sea, and so I know God is going to help us here where there's no water. Instead of saying that, they said, did God bring us out here to die of thirst? Where is God? How can he do that? How can he bring us out here to die of thirst? And I would challenge you, I hope you get this point so far this morning, they had every reason to believe God and still didn't. And the scripture uses this phrase, the Bible said, they said, verse number three, the whole congregation, verse two, of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the children of Israel said unto them, would to God that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, when we did eat bread to the full, for we have brought, he have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger and with thirst. And the scripture makes it very plain, verse number 15, or chapter number 15, that God gave them water. They came to a place where the water was bitter, uh, the Lord told uh, Moses what to do. They got clean water. Then in chapter 16, 
they come to this verse where they said, well, we got water back there, but it gave us water, but now we got no food. And so they began complaining about the food. Remember when I read it, first, when I first started here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where the Bible says, don't murmur like they murmured. I, I love saying this. I'm going to do it again. Some people have heard this already. Get tired of me saying it. I'm going to say it again. Murmur. You know what? You get angry when your kids murmur. When you do everything you can to help your kids and they murmur and complain about this and that. There have been times in my life, and my grandkids have done it more than once. My, my um, grandson, who's only seven, so he has a real good excuse at this point in time. But my grandson said the other day, I'm bored. You know what that's called? Yeah, you know what that's called. That's called murmuring. I'm murmuring. And I said, you can do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. I'm bored. Now, I don't know what bored him, but he was bored at that point in time. And in this passage of Scripture, the children of Israel are murmuring against God and against Moses and Aaron saying, well, yeah, and they didn't put it this way. This is the way they should have put it. He got us out of Egypt. We're no longer slaves. He saved our firstborn. We saw the miracles. He got us through the Red Sea. All the Egyptians that chased us are dead. And so I know he can take care of this. No, what they said is we have no water. 15th chapter, we have no water. So God gave them water. Then they got to the 16th chapter, same group of people got to the 16th chapter, should have said, God got us out of Egypt, we're no more slaves, he, he sent the plagues, we saw the firstborn, he brought us to the Red Sea, he killed the Egyptians and we don't have them anymore, and now he's going to take care, and he gave us water, so I'm sure he's going to take care of food now, but they didn't. They said, we were, we were back in Egypt where we had food. And the Bible says that Moses came to God and said, they're about ready to stone me. What am I going to do here? That are about ready to stone me. If you read the 16th chapter of Exodus, you'll find out that what God said was this. I am going to give you bread in the morning and flesh at night. What he really did was give them, the scripture actually calls it the, the food of the angels, manna, which is what they called it. The word manna means what is it? But it was called manna because it was a small seed. Uh, a small um, uh, wafer, kind of looked like the wafers we use for our um, uh, communion morning. But it said it tasted like honey and coriander seed. And every morning they went out, six days a week, they went out, and the manna was on the ground. And they picked it up, they brought it in their homes, they made bread out of it, they ate it raw, just like you would eat a, a, um, a, a small sweet tortilla of some kind. They ate it raw. At night he gave them quails. And he provided food for them. And then he said to them, in essence, and I'll use the terms that, that, that comes to my mind. Have I done enough now so that you know who I am and you know what I did and you know I want to bless you? Listen to what I say and obey me. And then he said with the, with the manna and the quail, six days you're going to find it. Don't go out on the seventh day. You see, before he ever gave the law, he gave them a day of rest because he took a day of rest, created everything in the six days. And the seventh day, the Bible said, God rested and he hallowed the seventh day and made it a holy day. And he said, go out six days, but don't bother on the seventh day because there's not going to be anything out there on the seventh day. And I think, you know, without me asking you this morning, what do you think that he did on the seventh day? Same people who didn't believe this, 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 didn't believe that either. And so many of them got up and they went on the seventh day trying to find manna. And for some reason or the other, God got a little ticked at them. And he said, how long will these people disobey me? And I would challenge you this morning, closing with this thought this morning. That when the book of Corinthians tells us, as Paul is writing down the scripture, he's reminding us of these people. And he said, don't be like them. They had this reason and 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 this reason. And, this reason, and I hope you remember them as we went along to believe me. And they still disobeyed. And Paul said, don't be like them. Don't be foolish. Don't be like them. And I'm going to close with this thought this morning. Sometimes we still are. Sometimes we still are. We see in our own life, not talking about anybody else, in our own life, how God blessed us here and here and here, healed our bodies here and here, gave us a financial blessing to get us out of trouble here, blessed us when we thought we were in a mess and couldn't get out, and sometimes just like those people, 
we don't believe God. And Paul said, don't do that. Don't do that. And I challenge you this morning, according to this passage of scripture, that we once again want to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 and 7. These things were written for our examples. Learn from them. Learn from them. I have to say that when I was going to school, there were times when I had a class, and I really liked the teacher, and that's probably why I did it. Really liked the teacher, and the test was coming up, so I studied. I wanted to get a good grade. I studied. I read it. I talked it over with myself. I reminded myself. I wrote it down. I studied because I wanted to get a grade because I liked the teacher. So I wanted to get a gr good grade. And I got a good grade. And there have been other times when I either got lazy or I wanted to go out and play baseball or I had other things to do that I didn't study. And shock of shocks, I didn't get the same kind of grade as when I studied. Now, if you can understand that, and I think you can, you're smart people, I think you can, then I would challenge you to realize when you study what God says, you're going to pass the test with flying colors. And when you ignore what God said, the only person you can blame for failing is the person you saw in the, mor in the, in the mirror this morning when you got ready to go where you're going. Only you. And I challenge you this morning, God loves you, he wants you to succeed, and he's given every answer we have need of in order to make sure we succeed, and now it's up to us. Father, I thank you today for the word of the Lord. I thank you for this passage of scripture and the things you teach us in it. And I pray, Lord, help us not to be like the Israelites who had every reason to believe and still didn't, every reason to obey and were still disobedient, every reason to be successful and still failed, Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, to be like those who believed you, the Moses, the Joshua, and the Caleb, that were a part of the children of Israel, who rose above that unbelief, and were willing to do what you told them to do, and became successful over success. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'll help us to realize it's really up to us, whatever we're going to do. I thank you for it this morning. I pray, Father, that as we go to our homes, you'll keep us from harm and danger. Bless those Lord, who are here this morning. Encourage those who could not be. Bless our audience, Lord, that will listen to this. Watch us later on. And we'll thank you as we ask these things in Jesus' name. For your honor, Lord, and your glory. Amen. God bless you. Shake hands. Be friendly. We're glad you're with us this morning.